Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I like to hear stories uh, about people who don't give up. People who face great, uh, great uh, odds and still keep on going. You know, people who uh, have handicaps, but don't allow their handicaps to get in the way of their achieving something. <coughs> Today we want to talk about faith again for the third time in a row this Sunday. Faith number three, as you note on your worship helps there. <coughs> Because we're going to continue with the theme of Hebrews 11, which goes into Hebrews 12, which talks about faith and never giving up no matter what. So I want to read the first three verses of Hebrews chapter 12 again for us. Beautiful words. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful man so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Christian friends, there's much we can learn about the saints of the past, and that's what this is all about. You notice the first word that's there is the word therefore. You see that word? The very first word, therefore, which connects what the writer of Hebrews is about to say with what's already been said. That's what the word therefore does. That's a connecting word. Now, look what he says. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Where are the witnesses? In chapter 11. That's where the witnesses are. That's where they're all at. And they're there to inspire us. You know, there's three points I'd like to make this morning from Hebrews chapter 12. Number one, here's the first point. Be inspired by those who have gone before us. Be inspired by those who have gone before us. We don't have time this morning, but we can go through chapter 11. <clears throat> And look at these witnesses again, which we did the last couple Sundays. But let's just re quickly review. First, first, uh, first of all, Noah. Noah. Can we learn anything from Noah in his life? You know, I'm not a very patient man. I'm not patient. Ask my wife. I, that's one thing I just don't have is patience. I want to get things done now. I don't want to wait. I don't have any patience. And oftentimes it's Noah that puts his finger on my back and says, Reiner, it took me 120 years to build the ark. Why are you so impatient? 120 years to build the ark. Imagine the patience of that man. Think we can learn from that? I think so. I think we can learn a lot from Noah. Or we keep on going. We get to, uh, we get to verse... Uh, Verse 8, Abraham. Can we learn from Abraham? The man that God said, leave this country. Leave your homeland. 75 years old he was. And come with me, God says. And he did. He was blessed for it. Or Abraham, the one who was promised a son. But he had to wait 25 years to get that son and finally got him when he was 100 years old. Then after he had the son, he was asked by God to sacrifice that son on an altar. Can we learn anything from Abraham, you think, about faith? Can we? I believe so. But we keep going. I mean, look at all these, look at all these saints, look at all these people. 
who set an example for us. Well, let's go to, <clears throat> let's go to Joseph, verse 22. Joseph. Can we learn anything from Joseph? Remember, Joseph was the man, uh, one of the brothers who was sold into slavery by his brothers, wound up in Egypt. And there, <clears throat> he was falsely accused by Potiphar, Potiphar's wife and wound up in prison for two years. And he was innocent. And then finally, God rewarded him for his faith, and he became the prime minister of the land of Egypt. And even as a prime minister, he was humble and kept his faith in God. Can we learn anything from Joseph? Moses? How about Moses? Can we learn something from Moses? I think so. You see, these, this is what is going on here. In other words, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, the witnesses being the heroes of faith, therefore, can't we run the race better because we have them to look back at and be encouraged by? See, these folks here, they whisper in our ear when we become discouraged. And they say to us, don't give up. Don't lose heart. Don't quit the race. Keep going. That's what they're saying to us in chapter 11 of Hebrews. These are the biblical heroes of faith. There's, and there's lots of them mentioned there. You know that. And each one of them has a story to tell. Each one of them was living by faith. And right now they're with the Lord. And they're looking down at us. And they're encouraging us. And saying, keep on running. Keep the race going. But you know, we also have present day witnesses. Not just biblical witnesses like Hebrews chapter 11. But we have present day witnesses as well. We all have. People, heroes of the past, who had faith, and we remember them. I want to share with you just a few this morning that I have in my life. People who have influenced me are now deceased, are now saints with the Lord, but they, had, they were powerful influences in my life. One of them was a man whose name was Elmer Hooper. Elmer Hooper. Elmer was a little guy. He was a young man. I was small, so of course, in Sunday school. I was like maybe eight, nine, ten years old. Elmer was in his late 20s, early 30s. Uh, he was married. But he's a little guy. <clears throat> little Elmer. We all says, Little Elmer. But little Elmer was there every Sunday in Sunday school teaching. He taught me in Sunday school for many years. A little Sunday school, of course, in South North Dakota. But Elmer was there. I remember Elmer. He encourages me in my life today. Or I think of a, of a woman. Her name was Dora Bangert in Fremont, Nebraska. When I got out of college, went to school, went to teach school in, in Fremont, Nebraska. Dora Banner took me in into her house. I stayed with her for two and a half years. She had very little so far as material wealth was concerned. She had a very humble home. Very humble home. She herself wore goodwill clothes. She was never married. Never had a family. Her family were the people that she helped out. She would board us. She wouldn't just let us live in her home. She would cook for us, us guys. For two and a half years, she did that. She's with the Lord now. But she's one of the witnesses of the past, of the faith that was in her. She lived by faith. Her favorite radio program, you know what it was? Her favorite radio program. 
she made sure that that program was on every week. The Lutheran Hour. The Lutheran Hour. That was her favorite. She had no television, obviously, at that time. She was a saint. Not in the Bible, but yet a witness to the faith. And so it goes on. I can tell you about a man here in Freeman. Yeah, here in Kalispell. Who is now deceased. Also a little man. Some of you may remember him. A little man. He's a member of Trinity Lutheran Church. Had great encouragement to me in his life. He used to always say, if you're going to ever do anything for God, do it now. Do it now! He'd always say, don't wait! Do it now! He loved the Lord so much. He lived by faith. He never looked back. He always looked forward. What an inspiration he was to me and still is today as I remember him. So when I think about quitting the race, I feel these hands on my shoulder. And they keep saying, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. Keep going, keep going, keep running. That's how it is in the Christian church. We all need encouragement, don't we, to run the race. Lest we give up. I found this on the internet just uh, as I was doing some searching this week for some, for some thoughts about this text. Listen to this. In the 1986 New York City Marathon, <clears throat> Almost 20,000 runners entered the race. 20,000 runners. Can't imagine. What is memorable is not who won, but who finished last. His name was Bob Wieland. He finished 19,430th, dead last. Bob completed the New York Marathon in four days. Two hours, 47 minutes, and 17 seconds. It was unquestionably the slowest marathon in history, ever. So what is it that made Bob Whelan's marathon so special? <coughs> Here it is. Bob ran with his arms. 17 years earlier, while in Vietnam, Bob's legs were blown off in battle. He sits on a 15-pound saddle, a horse saddle, and covers his fists with pads. He uses his arms to catapult himself forward one arm length at a time. He can run a mile in an hour. This is real endurance in the face of adversity. Can we be inspired by someone like this? So, you see, point number one is to run the race that we're all involved in, we need to be inspired by those who've gone before us. Secondly, we also need to be prepared for the struggles that will come. For the struggles that will come. You know, a runner writes as lightly as possible. You don't see marathon runners running with backpacks on their back. You don't see marathon runners running with big heavy shoes. You don't see marathon runners running with big overcoats on. No, they have shed all of their heavy things, have they not? They put it off. And that's exactly what the writer of Hebrews says. Listen to this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, which is the saints of the past, let us throw off everything that hinders. Let us throw off everything that hinders. What's that mean? What hinders? What gets us to slow down in our race? What is it that distracts us from running the race like we should for Christ? 
You know, it isn't the bad stuff. You know, Satan uses the good stuff we have in life. The fundamentally good stuff in life he uses it to distract us when we run the race. You know, good stuff like sports. Good stuff, right? But can it hinder us in our Christian race? Good. Or good stuff like recreation. Is recreation God-given? Yes, it is. Can it distract us? Can it hinder us from running the Christian race as we should? Yes, it can. Well, you name the good stuff. Whatever the good stuff is, it can distract us. Satan can use it, use it to slow us down, to get us distracted. Maybe it's even some possessions. That are, that's hindering you from witnessing to God as you should. Maybe it's some relationships that you, you need to throw off because they're hindering you and running the race as you should. Yeah, throw off everything that hinders so that we can walk with the Lord and love Him. Secondly, the writer also says, that we should get rid of that sin that so easily entangles. The sin that so easily entangles. And that's a good word, isn't it, for sin. It entangles. It entangles. I don't know, you're not as old as I am, so you would never remember the, the Tarzan movies of the past. Johnny Wisemiller. Remember those movies? He had a knife in his mouth. Go out to rescue Jane out there in the waters. He swim out there, and all of a sudden here comes this octopus and wrap its tentacles around around Tarzan. First of all, one tentacle, and then a second tentacle, and a third tentacle, and a fourth tentacle, and this octopus would wrap its tentacles around Tarzan. And you think, oh no, oh no, that's the end of Tarzan. But remember, he had his knife in his mouth. And he used that knife to cut himself loose from that octopus. And the blood would flow throughout the ocean. Remember those? Sin is like that. Sin is like that. Just a puff. Just a drink. Just once. Just one night. Here comes a tentacle. Just one lie. Just one lustful look. Another tentacle. Just a little lie. Oh, a slight re rearrangement of the truth. And out comes into tentacle. That's sin, isn't it? That's how sin gets us. One at a time. And the writer simply says, get rid of that sin that so easily entangles you. Because you cannot run the race well. When you're tangled up with sin in your life, you can't do it. It doesn't work. Get rid of that sin. And finally, the author also says, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Marked out for us. We all have a race that's marked out for us already. My race is different than yours. Yours is different than the person sitting next to you. We all have our own little race that's been marked out for us. God has given us that race. He's marked it out for us. And we are to run it. Now, I'm not a marathon runner. In fact, I'm not a runner. Somebody once said, and I agree with this, whenever the thought of running comes into my mind, I lay down a while until a thought goes away. <laughs> That's my idea of running. But anyway, marathon runners, marathon runners tell me that there's two uh, two places where 
were, were uh, in these crucial times. And one is at the beginning of the race. It's crucial. Because there's the temptation to, to since you're fresh, and your legs are fresh, a temptation to run too fast. And wear yourself out at the beginning and not pace yourself. It's crucial that you pace yourself. And you know, there's many, many Christians who have come to the Lord. And they get so excited about the Lord, but they have gone too fast, too quick. They burn out. There's a second crucial time in a race, marathon runners tell me. And that's in the middle of the race. Smack in the middle. If it's a 22-mile marathon, the 11-mile mark is crucial. Why? Because a thought comes in your mind. Gosh, I'm half done. But there's another half to go. My legs are tired. And my lungs are filled. I don't know if I can make it. I, can know, I don't know if I can make it. So the temptation to want to quit and stop running. That happens in the Christian life as well. We run the race for the Lord, and oftentimes we're tempted to, to quit, tempted to stop, we're tired of serving the Lord, tired of giving, giving, giving. The Bible says, run with perseverance. The race marked out for you. Run it. Run it. Because when you get to the finish line, there's going to be somebody waiting for you there. And he has his arms open for you. So that's number two. Third point is this. Always focus your attention on Jesus. Always focus your attention on Jesus. Listen to these words. This is verse, uh, verses uh, 3, or verse 2 and 3. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before us endured the cross, before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful man, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. As we run the race, why should we fix our eyes on Jesus? Why on Jesus? Well, there's lots of reasons. <clears throat> One reason is that if we don't fix our eyes on Jesus, we'll fix it on something else. On stuff. If we don't fix our eyes on the Creator, we will fix our eyes on the creation. Right? If we fix our eyes on Jesus, we have some strength to keep running. We have a reason to keep running. If we keep our eyes on Jesus, the best reason of all, though, to focus our eyes on Jesus is, is that. He ran the race marked out for him. And there was a race marked out for Jesus, too, just like there's a race marked out for us, each of us. There was a race marked out for Jesus. And he ran that race. He was opposed. He was persecuted. He stayed the course. He ran the race. He paid the price. That's the reason why we want to stay on the course and we want to fix our eyes on Jesus because He did. Now every Christian, I believe, in every church needs to hear this because it's so easy to quit. It's so easy to get discouraged in our Christian life. I know a lot of people who have stopped running the race before they got to the goal. It's so easy to say, I don't want to do this anymore. And the writer keeps saying, focus your eyes on Jesus. Why? Because he's the author of our faith. 
He's the one that put this all together for us, Jesus did. He's the perfecter of our faith. He's the finisher. He's the goal. Remember I, I said that there's somebody waiting for you at the end of this race? He has open arms. He's waiting for you. That's Jesus. He's the finisher of the race. We will all someday stand before the finish line. And at the finish line is Jesus. The one who already ran the race for each of us. And we are there with him. He sees us as we are. He knows how hard we've run the race. He knows. He knows everything about us. And there's only one thing that we can what? Think about at that time, and that is grace. Grace. And Jesus is there with his grace, accepting us, forgiving us all of our sins because he died for us. That's the end of the goal. That's the end of the race. And we want to keep on. I have a funeral on Thursday. Uh, George Tripp passed away yesterday, and I was up there with the family. George, <coughs> in many ways, had a tough life. <coughs> Rancher. But he came to know the Lord. Someday we will all end the race. Someday. In the meantime, we want to keep running, keep believing, keep doing the things that God wants us to do. Keep running the race that's marked out for us. And not give up. I just want to encourage you in your race. Because I know some of you are going through tough times in your race. It's not an easy life that we live in. There's so many things going on. I want to encourage you in the Lord that you fix your eyes on Jesus. And He will receive you when you finish the race. You will fall on the finish line, but you'll fall right into the arms of your wonderful Savior. In Jesus' name.